Hi everyone, this is Dan, and this is the Uncanny X-Men uh, number 210. Uh, and this is the first issue of the Mutant Massacre event uh, that occurred back in the 80s. Uh, by the way, this is a uh, iconic cover. Uh, I don't know how many times it's been copied. I think the last time I saw someone who uh, did a tribute to this cover was, uh, I think one of the Alterna titles did it. I forget what the name of the title was, but uh, yeah, no, uh, so... John Romita Jr.'s era of art on the Uncanny X-Men is a little up and down for the most part, uh, but I will say this, I always uh, enjoyed uh, his covers. You see, he has a couple bad covers, but for the most part his covers were always very uh, interesting, uh, or at least really good composition for the most part. <laughs> Anyhow, let's jump into this. Uh, so this uh, uh, crossover kind of marked the beginning of uh, almost a yearly uh, thing of having crossovers with mutants on uh, on the uh, the X-Men line of books back in the the uh, late 80s and then it continued on through uh, the early 90s before kind of the the popularity of the X-Men kind of started to wane a little bit but uh, yeah we open up this book essentially is a uh, two plot book uh, and is kind of a what we would call one of Chris Claremont's famous uh, rest issues where every time after like a major climactic event, uh, Claremont would kind of have the X-Men, uh, you know, <laughs> just play baseball or, or, or go to a, go shopping or something. <laughs> and uh, some readers uh, uh, really liked it, some readers not so much. Uh, I know the artists of the time, especially the image guys, they hated this crap. They wanted every issue to be kind of uh, uh, basically a never-ending splash page session. But uh, yeah, so this is... Uh, the Morning After, uh, again, uh, this era of the Uncanny X-Men was written by Chris Claremont. This is the John Romita Jr. Dan Green era of art, uh, colors by Glennis Oliver, uh, Tom Orzichowski as the letter, uh, edited by Ann Nascenti, editor-in-chief Jim Shooter. So we open up uh, this guy who is in the attire of the Hellfire Club uh, is getting freaking speared in the back. Uh, Technicolor Lady is screaming out his name. And uh, what you find out is uh, essentially these two are kind of on the run and they both kind of left both the Hellfire Club and uh, the Morlocks because uh, this girl is a Morlock. Uh, a fascinating uh, group of mutants that were introduced by Chris Claremont about, I think, uh, what was it, 20 or 30 issues, issues ago? I forget who the original artist was, uh, but the first Morlock introduced was Caliban. And uh, then you got introduced to uh, the, the other Morlocks. And uh, man, my brain is like frying right here. I can't remember her name, but the leader of them at the time until she got her ass kicked by Storm. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is Tommy. Uh, she ends up, she is kind of uh, sort of seeing this Hellfire guy. And uh, she's, he's begging her uh, to save him. Uh, but she leaves him because she's terrified for her life. Uh, we find this mysterious band of characters who executes uh, Richard here, who is the the Hellfire guy, and Tommy thinks she escapes, uh, and then uh, only to find out that uh, not really. Uh, looks like these uh, shady characters have a plan coming up ahead. Uh, we jump over to San Francisco. We started in Los Angeles. We jumped to San Francisco, and uh, we uh, visit uh, Dazzler, who is now uh, dyeing her hair and living a different life. By the way, the era of John Romita Jr.'s art here, he always did this with a lot of women. He always had this, like, you know, kind of pronounced chin and high cheekbones and then these lines that went from the cheekbones to the mouth. Uh, it was always kind of weird, <laughs> or at least for me reading it, I was like, man, this like way of drawing uh, women is kind of odd. Uh, I never got really used to it in his run here, uh, cause like when he draws it like this, where it's less pronounced, uh, like this is genuinely, you know, nice looking. Uh, great art by, by uh, uh, JRJR here, but uh, the other pages not so much. Anyhow, uh, what uh, follows is a really nice uh, example of Chris Claremont once again showing how you go about, you know, jumping scenes and bringing a character in. So it's kind of abrupt change to go to San Francisco here, but uh, what he does is he uses, again, thought balloons to kind of uh, explain uh, Blair's uh, or Allison Blair's situation here, uh, Dazzler situation, to the reader such that you kind of understand what's going on here. And then the moment she's kind of done, you know, inner monologuing to herself, here comes Malice. And uh, you get sort of a, a crazy dream sequence right here. And uh, you get kind of a teaser of what's to come with the uh, gold choker on, uh, on Dazzler here. 
Uh, again, we jump over to Rogue. She's kind of flying around. So the previous uh, three issues or so was kind of a, uh, a fascinating uh, event where uh, Phoenix, uh, uh, Rachel Summers, not the original Phoenix, uh, attacked uh, Celine and almost killed her. And Wolverine had to kind of stop her, and he almost he kind of went too far and almost killed Phoenix. And then they got into a big fight with Nimrod and uh, the Hellfire Club. And now Rogue is kind of flying around New York City trying to find Phoenix because she's disappeared. Uh, she ends up doing a heroic job saving these two guys. Uh, kind of funny scene here where the, the guy wants to kiss her. Again, man, the chin is so pronounced here. I, like, John Romita Jr. drew Rogue really weird. Uh, and I could see why it, it's a little bit of a mixed uh, era of art for the X-Men. Because, man, when you jump over to Mark Silvestri and Jim Lee drawing Rogue, yeah, it's, it's a big difference between John Romita Jr.'s way of drawing Rogue. <laughs> so uh, Rogue kind of decides to take a break, and Claremont gets a little silly here with her going to Bloomingdale's and uh, dressing up in uh, nicer clothes. You get a, uh, a classic X-Men scene of someone who is anti-mutant, uh, going over and uh, basically accosting Rogue before the, the man that she saved stops him and she has to bounce out and then you get a little preview of what's going on in other issues, mainly X-Factor, which I'm not going to talk about X-Factor in this review, that's like I'll go over it when I go over X-Factor uh, for the Mutant Massacre review, uh, but as you can see, this is kind of a, a uh, slice of life ep episode almost <laughs> And it's kind of funny because people always complain that comics never do, like, other genres besides cape shit, right? But the reality is the X-Men actually were doing slice-of-life uh, style issues all the time. That was kind of what Claremont did uh, during this era that the X-Men were at the, the peak of their popularity. I think the key uh, to his success, though, was that he didn't do slice-of-life every single issue. This issue, as you can see, it's, it's uh, slow. People aren't, there's not really a lot of action going on. But he's moving quickly and stuff is going on and every character is kind of being hit on the right notes, right? So you get a great scene with Peter and Ileana. Uh, they're kind of reminiscing about the old days. And at the same time, Peter's kind of saying what a lot of readers at the time were kind of wondering, which is, you know, the X-Men aren't really, uh, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing lately. They've kind of been sucked in, and muddled about in a lot of events that have, uh, that have pushed their moral... Uh, uh, fiber to a degree, right? Uh, Phoenix, you know, in a way, almost tried to go out and assassinate Celine, even though Celine is a genuinely evil woman. If anybody read my Magma Origins uh, for my New Mutant series, you can see that. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't justify uh, trying to assassinate her, and it doesn't justify also Wolverine trying to freaking kill Phoenix to stop her, right? So the, the X-Men are kind of in a, in a, in a crisis right now uh, in terms of uh, the makeup of the team, Xavier's gone, Magneto, who is normally their mortal enemy, is now the leader of the X-Men. It's a very odd time for the X-Men, and uh, Colossus kind of uh, encapsulates that in his conversation with Ileana. Uh, we move over to Kitty Pride, who's busy fixing stuff. Uh, you know, in, in this era, Chris Claremont wrote uh, Kitty Pride to be sort of an electrical engineering savant. And uh, at times it's a little bit, you know, hand wavy, but he does a good enough job in, in trying to get her to, to be that. And uh, she kind of goes off into her own monologue right here about her own thoughts. In general, it's a lot of characters, uh, you know, inner monologuing or uh, talking aloud to themselves and, you know, sort of going over the situation that is kind of uh, uh, plaguing the X-Men at the time. This is very classic Chris Claremont. And there are people who uh, hate this style of writing because they just want everything to be a Dragon Ball Z fight. Uh, but uh, to me, this is kind of what made the X-Men the X-Men, and this is kind of what made American comics great, right? You get these great inner monologues, but if you take a look at it, it's only really uh, a couple panels. And then here comes Peter, and then you get uh, back and forth between them about what to do. And then... Uh, they get a call and they gotta go save Nightcrawler. Magneto shows up or outside the Hellfire Club. You got a pretty funny scene here where this is X Factor and I'll talk about this later, but uh, it's a funny back and forth between uh, Wheezy on X Factor, uh, Louis Simonson, and Chris on the regular uh, Uncanny X-Men where both Magneto and X Factor kind of misunderstand each other. Uh, Magneto doesn't understand why the original X-Men are now apparently mutant exterminators. 
and uh, the original X-Men cannot understand why Magneto is now, you know, supposedly the leader of the X-Men, but he's going over to the Hellfire Club. Uh, <laughs> so we get a great back and forth between Magneto and the Hellfire Club, where essentially the Hellfire Club is telling him, hey, there's some people going around trying to murder mutants, and there's X-Factor trying to exterminate us. You know, the Hellfire Club and the X-Men should come together and form an alliance of evil. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Magneto's kind of seeing through it and it's like, yeah, no way. You tried to, like, steal the new mutants, uh, you know, from me before. Uh, I kind of sniffed bullshit, you know. But at the same time, the, the X-Men aren't in a good place. So Magneto kind of goes and, and gives him a little bit of an olive branch and says, I'll think about it. We get the sort of final uh, uh, conflict of this book which is we catch up with Nightcrawler uh, as he's being uh, sort of a callback to the original giant size X-Men. He's being assaulted by these uh, anti-mutant uh, uh, folks. And Ileana teleports um, uh, Peter, uh, Colossus, and Kitty Pride to the scene. And uh, we have a great uh, Peter Rasputin scene. This is like when, this is one of the best uh, written scenes of Colossus in my opinion. I, I really like this. He jumps into action, he defends his friend Nightcrawler, and he stands up to the crowd. Uh, and to a degree, I kind of feel a little bit that Kitty Pride jumping in here kind of takes away from what uh, Colossus does here. Uh, but luckily, you know, Chris writes it good enough that, uh, that Kitty kind of works in this scene for the most part. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the typical Chris Claremont era of X-Men, where the X-Men, you know, there was a focus on, you know, the prejudice uh, against uh, humanity versus the, the mutants, right? A lot of it is essentially fear, right? The, the primary theme of the X-Men is humanity's fear of the mutants. The mutants being, you know, the supermen, the, the future of humanity, you know, homo superior, as Magneto says it. Uh, but Kitty's able to sort of fight down this crowd and save Kurt. And it turns out Kurt is uh, running into some issues here. He's not able to use his powers. And he's kind of... Uh, and that's why he was in that predicament. Normally Nightcrawler would just pop, teleport right out, right? We get a final scene here. This is uh, Wolverine and uh, Storm talking to each other. Wolverine, uh, using his advanced senses, has tracked down Phoenix to this empty auditorium where if you read the previous issue, you know what happens to Phoenix. I'm not going to spoil it to you. You know, just go grab uh, these X-Men comics. They're really worth getting, in my opinion. Uh, and you, uh, you have a very uh, touching scene between Storm and Wolverine, where, you know, Wolverine is, is kind of going through his own struggles, right? You know, he knows that essentially, you know, he, ki he almost uh, killed Phoenix uh, with what he did, right? And uh, Storm, you know, is telling him, like, hey, you know, I get that you have a past and then you that you have issues, but we need you on this team and I need to rely on you. You got to be there for us uh, because tough times are coming ahead and indeed tough times are coming ahead for the mutants. Uh, both the uh, the mutant massacre uh, saga that's coming up, the uh, fall of the mutants, and then the eventual uh, inferno saga that comes in after that. These were a very hectic time for the the X Men. They were kind of. Uh, constantly being hurled into uh, <laughs> into danger in every single <laughs> in every single issue uh, back in the days. But uh, anyhow, we catch up with Tommy. She's made it back to the sewers of New York to join the Morlocks, except not. And uh, these uh, characters, the Marauders, catch her and essentially assassinate her. And uh, that begins the massacre. <laughs> so yeah, uh, man, dude, this is like holy shit. This is like. 14 minutes but <laughs> a lot actually happens in this book despite it being uh you know a slow rest issue uh for chris claremont and it was kind of the uh, par for the course of this era uh again the storytelling was compressed so even though this was an issue where the x-men were kind of resting and not necessarily getting into a big fight or in a big conflict uh look at how much uh happened in this issue pretty amazing you got a ton of entertainment out of essentially 75 cents Ooh, <laughs> of money back in the day. Like, man, dude, if, if I was living back in, then and I picked this up for 75 cents, I would not have regretted it. This is a great issue. Anyhow, uh, that's the video, folks. Uh, let me know what you think. If you like this review, uh, please hit the thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Hit the bell for notifications. You got any comments about the Uncanny X-Men 210 or the Mutant Massacre uh, event? <laughs> Leave it down below, and I will see you 
next time.